Welcome, everyone. This is Robin Duncan. I am here with my husband, Terry Macy. Hi, everyone. It is great to be here. This is our A Course in Miracles Global Study Group, and today we are on Chapter 18, Section 7, called I Need Do Nothing. If you are new to this series, be sure to register as a member. You can do that anytime at ACIM globalstudygroup.com and we will send you what you have missed. You can always listen to those prior recordings at your own pace. So don't worry about that we're on Chapter 18. You can jump right in with us and still pick up right there at Chapter 1 and it will still work out. This series is freely offered to everyone and if you do offer donations to support this ministry, they are tax deductible and they definitely help us to keep these free materials coming your way. And, of course, this is always at your own discretion. Let's go ahead and start with an opening prayer. Draw in a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Dear God, we come to you today. We're excited to be together, thinking about you, honoring all that you have given, being aware that we are your holy, precious child. We are one with each other and one with you. We are learning that this story that we have about ourselves that we might have made up somewhere along the way based on experiences and perceptions, this is not the truth of us. We are asking for the truth. We know that you have never forgotten our true identity, and that we can reclaim our true self at any time. Today, we are willing to see everything and everyone differently and welcome the healing of our mind. If there's any place in our mind where we are still deciding against ourself or someone else or even our future, if we have a dark vision of the future or a fearful one, we are willing to see that differently. And we call upon the Holy Spirit to decide for us about the future for everyone. We will step back and let you lead the way. Amen. Well, welcome, everyone. When we hear those words, I need do nothing, It can be very frustrating, can't it? When you are doing a lot of things or you're trying to manage a lot of things, and sometimes it feels like there's just no one else to do it. Maybe you have a whole flock of children you're taking care of, and maybe you're doing that by yourself. Or maybe you have so much work to do, and you're the only one, as far as you know, that can get that work accomplished. And so we can really feel overwhelmed sometimes and There's all these steps and these things, and then we're trying to meditate, we're trying to keep our thoughts clear and positive, and it can feel so heavy when we're trying to do all the right things. And then we read in A Course in Miracles, it says, I need do nothing. So tonight we'll talk more about that. What does that mean? Does that mean I can just quit on everyone and walk out the door? Sometimes we wish, right? (laughs) But... It's not exactly that. The Course teaches us that truth and illusion are irreconcilable, which means that when you are paying attention to one, you're going to forfeit your awareness of the other. This is very important to remember because when we fixate on the problem, what is also called the illusion, because God did not create us to have problems, so when we perceive a problem, It doesn't mean that we are flawed or bad or doing the wrong thing. It just means that we have accepted a false image or a false story into our mind, and it's literally blocking what is true. So when we focus on the problem and trying to find the answer, the bigger problem about that is we're going to become unaware of the truth, which means also we will become unaware of our connection with God unaware of our divine wisdom, unaware of our unlimited abundance, unaware that we are safe and healed, happy, blessed, and whole. 
all of these things will become unaware in our mind. We will become unaware of them. So we have to recognize this. And he tells us again and again that you cannot have both, that when you focus on one, you're going to forfeit your awareness of the other. You might think of it in a physical way, just to give it more context. I was given this image earlier today. It's almost like when you're trying to solve a problem, it's almost like you're splashing in a pool. Maybe you feel that you're drowning in some way, or maybe you feel like someone else is and that you are the only hope of saving them. So let's say you're splashing around, you're splashing around, and you feel like the problem is in the water, it's in the pool with you, and you're just doing everything you know to try to solve that problem. And let's say that the idea of freedom would be that you're outside of that pool and just relaxing in a chase lounge by the side of the pool. And you can't really be in both places at the same time. And this is what the Course is helping us to understand, that when we are in the problem, we're trying to solve the problem, fix the problem. It's like we're swimming around in that pool. This is my example, of course. It's not out of the course in this way, but just trying to give it some imagery. But when we are realizing that we need do nothing, it's a recognition. In the Course, it says it is a statement of allegiance. Because let's say you're swimming in the pool, you're doggy paddling, you're tired. You've been doing it a long time. You're swimming here, swimming there, trying to find the answer, maybe for yourself, maybe for someone else. It's really all the same. So let's say you're swimming and swimming and swimming, and you don't want to get out of the pool because it would feel like you're abandoning the problem. If you were to just get out, it would feel like maybe you failed. Your ego would offer you 15 different versions of how you have failed and now you should be guilty and how you're leaving someone behind or you are disappointing them. So we're learning that this whole business of trying to solve problems, trying to change things, to get from bad illusions to good illusions, when we're doing this, this is when we become unaware of our relationship with God. And when that happens, we feel really vulnerable, and we can even feel very depressed and powerless, sometimes hopeless. But it's not because we are. It's because we have let go of what is true, what is real, what does have power, and what we can entirely place our hopes upon. So you see, it's like an all-or-nothing kind of deal. What is true is everything. What is not true is nothing. It's the absence of everything. So while we're out there trying to solve or fix the problem, while we're paddling around doing the best we can, if you would just say to yourself, this is what we can do in practice, Holy Spirit, you're teaching me that I need do nothing. I may not understand this. I may not even know what to do about it or what the next step might be. But I'm willing to acknowledge that the solving of this problem that I find myself in is not up to me because I'm the one that kind of got myself lost in this pool. So I'm going to presume that there is this higher power that does love me, that does want to show me my way out of my own problem, whatever that would look like. And I'm willing to consider I need do nothing. Well, you see, right there, there's a little bit of a quandary in your mind because if you need do nothing, then what? Do you float on your back? Do you swim to the side of the pool? Do you abandon those people over there that you thought needed your help? Do you stop trying to save yourself if you feel like you were drowning? Do you just let yourself drown? You see, the ego gets really locked up in our mind when we say, I need do nothing because... It's trying to have you solve all of these things at once. And when you stop and you welcome the Holy Spirit and you say, I need do nothing, it is a statement of allegiance. It means I am learning to recognize that this pool of problems that I am in, it is an illusion. It is a projection of my own mind. It is a false story that I have made, that I have given life to, 
and it's actually blocking my awareness of the truth. Now, it doesn't mean I need to jump right out of the pool and just abandon the whole thing. And the reason is, is that it would really elevate my fear, wouldn't it? Or my temptation to feel guilty or just scared for everybody. So divine love will always pace with us. Divine love knows that my problems in truth aren't even real. We struggle with them because we believe they're real. We even have problems at night when we're asleep and dreaming. Those problems seem real as well. Higher consciousness knows what is real and true, but we do not. We've forgotten. And we think just because we can touch something or feel something or it seems to be painful, well, it must be real. But you see, if God did not create pain or darkness or any form of suffering or any trace of sorrow, that means those things that we see that represent this, they are not real. And if they are not real, they are illusions. And if they are illusions, they have no power. They have no power to hurt, harm, alter, threaten, or delay anyone for any reason. Now, we don't understand this. And we are the holy child of God, which is a very big deal. And so if the holy child of God believes that these illusions are real, then we become unaware of our true reality. And worse yet, we project these beliefs about what is not real, and we see them in front of us as if they are real. So there's all this going on, and it gets scary. So when we hear those words, I need do nothing, it's like, oh, please, of course I need to do something, or I will drown, or they will, or someone will. I will disappoint someone, I will fail someone, or I won't get ahead, or my future will be terrible. But if we pause, whatever you're facing tonight, and just begin to understand that you're not looking at reality. You are looking at your version of reality, and it's actually blocking the light of truth. And when the light of truth is able to enter your mind, it's already there, but it becomes known to you in your awareness when you abandon your investment in the unreal. Remember, we cannot experience what is real and unreal at the same time. We cannot be awake and asleep at the same time. We cannot know truth and illusions at the same time. So every time we invest in the problem and fixing the problem and fixing that person and trying to get through that illness, it doesn't mean we will not be guided on what to do because we will be. But if we try to do it from our own plan and we're trying to solve it outside of ourselves, this is when it will seem to never be solved. We want to pause. We want to remember, I need do nothing, because this is a statement of allegiance to the understanding that I am looking at projection. I'm not looking at the truth. And you can remind yourself, I will not assign power to what has no power, that if I'm experiencing this illness, I am probably seeing this illness as having power to hurt, harm, or alter me. So I'm going to be willing to see that differently. I'm going to recognize I need do nothing because this is my statement of allegiance to the truth. I don't need to know what the truth is yet, but I do need to want to know the truth. I do need to invite the truth, and I do need to decide against my own projections, my own miscreations, not the people, but what those people are representing. If someone in your life is representing that you are not lovable or that you shouldn't be respected or that you shouldn't be treated kindly or that you shouldn't have what you want or you shouldn't be supported, these people are mirrors. They are mirroring our unhealed thoughts and beliefs. This is why A Course in Miracles calls these people our saviors because they're actually showing us what we are still carrying around that is weighing us down. And if we will look at what they're showing us, and instead of judging them and reinforcing it, we can actually pause right there, remind ourselves I need do nothing, which means I don't need to fix this. It's not based on the truth. 
And now I can give this whole problem, along with all the thoughts that put the problem there, over to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the problem solver. But notice we added, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit this place in my mind where my thoughts are projecting this problem. That's where the problem gets solved. And so today, we're just going to declare, whatever problem we face, I need do nothing. Because instantly, the Holy Spirit is able to talk to you a little more in a way that you can hear him. Because you are beginning to refuse to validate what you are looking at. You are beginning to remember that you are the dreamer of your dream. And that the healing is in your mind, it's not out there where that person is or where the problem is. And the beginning of the healing starts here. Because we, as the dreamer of our dream, we are dreaming up these problems. We are dreaming up this chaos. And until our mind is healed by the Holy Spirit, then the problem is not likely to show up as resolved in our own view. So pause. Be willing to consider that you are the dreamer of your dream. You are looking at the story that you made up. You're willing to see it differently. You're willing to declare that I need do nothing. And this actually invites higher consciousness to intervene and accomplish the healing for you. But we're coming from an understanding that we are not looking at the truth. Because the Holy Spirit can't come in and just fix your problem because it's a projection. The Holy Spirit can only heal your mind that is producing the problem. But this cannot occur until the Holy Spirit is wholly invited and we are willing to refuse these projections that we see and we are willing to consider that they are false. They are false appearances, appearing real. And we do it at night. We have dreams. We don't know that we're dreaming. The Course is teaching us that we are not yet awake all the way. We think we are. But the only reason we don't let ourselves wake up all the way is because we are highly invested in our special relationships. Maybe it's our partner. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our little dog or cat. Maybe it's our work that we feel is so important Whatever it is we are committed to here in this story we have made, it's actually holding us from allowing ourselves from waking up. And this is where the Holy Spirit can guide us on that full awakening, and then we will remember what is true, all that we have been given, and to understand that God never created a reason for us to suffer under any circumstances. And he says, first, we will pass through the darkened dream, which we know so well. Then it will get lighter, lighter, lighter. It will become the happy dream. This is where things actually go quite well. We will practice being happy for a while under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then we will fully awaken. And there will be no more dreams, nothing like that to worry about. No more perceptions because knowledge will be remembered. And when this happens, it's a happy day because our eternal happiness will be known once again. So remember that I need do nothing doesn't mean stop what you're doing right now and don't do anything. It's not about the physical. It's about a letting go of a need to solve. We all know what that means. It's not the easiest thing to get to. But he tells us that just our little effort, our little willingness, to let the problem be turned over is really worthwhile. And that's the indicator for the Holy Spirit to intervene and to help you with it. Remember, the Holy Spirit is the problem solver and that you are the one to invite the problem solver. But let's be very aware the problem is in our mind. It's not out there. So while we're swimming around in the pool trying to solve everything outside of us, There's not a whole lot that's going to happen because we're actually reinforcing all those old beliefs that are causing the problems in the first place. So I need do nothing is where we get a little quieter. 
We're offering a willingness to see everything and everyone differently. And if someone were to offer us a hand at the side of the pool, we might just hop up a little bit and hop out. And we don't know what's supposed to happen there, but we are willing to listen to that guidance, trust it, follow it, and place all of your people and problems in God's hands. Know that there's not one person that's going to be dropped and that no one will suffer because you are choosing to wake up. With God, there is only gain. There is no loss. And be willing to entrust the Holy Spirit with your loved ones. You must. It doesn't mean you're abandoning them. It means that you are making room in your mind to let these problems be resolved at their source, which is in our mind. And when you do that, it's going to feel a little funny. It's going to feel like you're abandoning someone in some way, but you're just making room for the true problem solver to intervene to accomplish the healing for you, to handle the retaliation of the ego for you. It's an excellent step. You will see the benefits. Just it's a time of trust. It's a time of faith. And you won't know until you give it a go, and you'll see that this is where things start to get resolved. And then it really builds your confidence, and then you are eager to turn every problem over. And this will come with time. Trust is developed. In the Course, it says it is not innate. It is not something that we just automatically do. It's developed. Because as we turn something over to the Holy Spirit, and we start to see the benefits of that decision, well, then it will be easier and easier to turn every problem over. So remind yourself frequently, maybe the next few days, I need do nothing. It says so much, and it's a great reminder that we're looking at projection. We're not looking at the truth. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to sort all this mess out, but most importantly, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to enter our mind and show us what is real and true, and then the effect of that will be shown in the world we see. That's how we get to the healing. All right, Terry, why don't you launch us off here with a little humor? Okay. My humor for today is called The Mysterious Weatherman. A film crew was on location in the desert to shoot some movie scenes. One day, an elderly wise man who lived in the desert mysteriously showed up on the movie set and went up to the director and said, tomorrow it will rain. The next day, it rained, and they could not shoot their movie scene. A week later, the same wise man showed up again and went up to the director again and said, tomorrow it will storm. The next day, there was a hailstorm, so again they could not shoot their movie scene. This wise man is incredible, said the director. He told his secretary hire him immediately to predict the weather for the rest of the movie shoot. However, after several successful predictions, the wise man didn't show up for two weeks. Finally, the director sent for him and told him, I have to shoot a big scene tomorrow, said the director, and I'm depending on you. What will the weather be like? The wise man shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, my radio broke. See, practical advice. We all need it. (laughs) That's cute. (laughs) Some things aren't as they appear. (laughs) That's right. All right. (laughs) Let's go ahead and get started with Chapter 18, Section 7 on I Need Do Nothing, Paragraph Number 1. You still have too much faith in the body as a source of strength. What plans do you make that do not involve its comfort or protection or enjoyment in some way? This makes the body an end and not a means in your interpretation, and this always means you still find sin attractive. So as we take a look at this, it's talking about how we see ourselves as a body and that this body is the one to solve all these problems that we encounter so he wants us to remember that we are not a body and that's why the answer doesn't even involve the body and terry and i both for 
the situations that we did not know how to solve and we have gone in prayer and asked for help with it. We turned over the healing of our mind. We were willing to refuse to validate what we're looking at with our eyes. The answers that come through, those God solutions that you witness with your own eyes, it's always something you didn't expect. Isn't that right, Terry? Oh, exactly. It's most definitely after multiple, multiple experiences, it's always typically been something you never expected, and it occurs in a way that you didn't even fathom, wasn't even on your radar as a possible solution. It's so amazing. When you turn something over, you stop trying to use your body to solve the problem, basically. You're no longer assigning the answer to yourself. This is when you're recognizing that the body is meaningless. It has no role in bringing the answer and as you begin to recognize this this is an automatic invitation for the holy spirit to show you something else so that's why when we say i need do nothing it's a declaration it means i'm beginning to understand that i'm not the problem solver i'm beginning to understand that i'm the dreamer of my dream and i'm looking at the story i made up i'm beginning to understand that even this body is an illusion And certainly it's not up to this body that I made up to solve any problem whatsoever. So I need do nothing is the beginning of that awareness. It's almost like you've had the door closed to God and the answers that are there. And when you say I need do nothing, you're beginning to kind of unlock all the deadbolts on your own door. So it's not the end, but it's the beginning of that understanding. So let's be aware that the body is not our source of strength, that the Holy Spirit is our source of strength, that the power of God is within us, and the Holy Spirit has been given the function to lead us back to what is true. It's literally the Holy Spirit's function. We did a class once with Mighty Companions where we talked about our role versus the Holy Spirit's role, and I tried to make a point there because there was several pages of notes with a vertical line down the middle two columns. One is the column of what we have to do, and the other column is what the Holy Spirit does, as quoted from the Course. And it went on for pages and pages, what the Holy Spirit has to do, and everything that He's responsible for. And then for us, it's kind of like the invitation to be sure to forgive everyone for everything, don't hold any grievances, to be willing to expect a happy outcome. There's like three or four steps, that's it. And to be willing to know everyone will play their roles perfectly in this happy answer, whatever it is, and to really step back and let Holy Spirit enter. And then we go over to the other column, and you should see what the Holy Spirit is responsible for. Man. (laughs) And I just took a few quotes out of the course, and I was already on to four pages of what the Holy Spirit has to do according to God. So be glad that you are not the Holy Spirit, because... He's got a lot to do in your name. The last part about this is he says that this makes the body an end when you're trying to solve something with the body and not a means in your interpretation. And this always means you still find sin attractive. Now, the world sees sin as maybe bad, salty behavior. That's not really what A Course in Miracles means in The course, sin is more like the mistake, the misperception. You still find your illusions attractive. You still find your unhealed beliefs worthy of your attention. So when you're focused on what is not true, you could call that sin. It's like missing the mark or missing the target. So when you see that word, it doesn't mean it's implying guilt or darkness or evil in someone It's just that you're still preoccupied with what is not real, what is not true, what does not exist. So that is our investment in sin, and that is where we are still finding it attractive. Every time we're using the body to solve what we see with our eyes, it means we are still very attracted to illusions. And the problem with that is we will still be unaware of what is real, which happens to come with the answer we seek. So let's go to sentence four. 
No one accepts atonement for himself who still accepts sin as his goal. You have thus not met your one responsibility. Atonement is not welcomed by those who prefer pain and destruction. When you hear that, you might think to yourself, well, I don't prefer pain and destruction. Who would want to have pain and destruction or who would prefer it? Well, sometimes we grow up in a way that pain and destruction is all we know. It's just our human experience that we don't really know about happiness. We don't really know about an alternative to pain. So it's not that we sit around saying, I wish I had more pain. To prefer something means we're giving it more attention. We may not even want to, but we do. So whenever you're giving something more of an investment than you're giving something else, you could say it has preference. So it doesn't mean I prefer it because I think it's a good thing. It means I'm giving it my time, my attention, my investment. So notice he says atonement is not welcomed, might underline that, by those who prefer, you might even say choose pain and destruction or choose to preoccupy your mind with pain and destruction. And what he's saying there is the atonement is that recognition of the truth. It's the realization that the separation from God never occurred and that you do not have to suffer and that you don't need to sacrifice. So all of this awareness that will come flooding into your mind, it cannot be known to you when you have an investment in pain and destruction and you're unwilling to abandon your own investment. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So it's not about you preferring pain. It just means that through preference of where you're placing your time, attention, and investment, you are actually preferring pain. So let's get our attention on over to the Holy Spirit. Let's make that goal of peace every day, every time you're faced with anything that disturbs your peace, and let the Holy Spirit decide for you about all of it, especially those judgments. Do not cast guilt. Do not sit and decide what this other person is doing wrong, that they should do better. This is that step into darkness, and the Course says it will be followed by another and another and another. So let's pause. Let's just know that anything that is disturbing our peace, it means we have a misperception, and we call on the Holy Spirit to heal the misperception, and now we're really cooking. We're creating fertile ground for the miracle to occur. The miracle is not up to us. It's up to the Holy Spirit. But we are now opening the door because God cannot give us what we're unwilling to have. And every time we say, I need do nothing, or I'm willing to see this differently, or I choose forgiveness instead of this judgment against this person, I'm choosing to see the light and innocence in them instead of what I see now. When we say these things, we are unbolting the door. And what do you know, Holy Spirit has been standing there the whole time. Let's go to paragraph two. There is one thing that you have never done. You have not utterly forgotten the body. It has perhaps faded at times from your sight, but it has not yet completely disappeared. You are not asked to let this happen for more than an instant. Yet it is in this instant that the miracle of atonement happens. Afterwards, you will see the body again, but never quite the same. And every instant that you spend without awareness of it gives you a different view of it when you return. It's probably true that we have never utterly forgotten the body. A few of us, I know I've had maybe four experiences where I've left my body, that certainly changes your mind about things (laughs) for those of you that have had that happen before. And it always seems that you can't really do it automatically or when you want to. I do have friends that can do that, and it's pretty awesome that they can do that. But we have not utterly forgotten the body. And in fact, even if you leave your body, the moment you think about your body, boom, you're right back in your body. So there's a lot about this whole body thing. You might just spend a little time in meditation. doesn't need to take a lot of time. But instead of being inside looking out, 
and thinking that the whole world is outside of this body and that you're the body and then everybody else is out there. Maybe just imagine being way out in the corner of your living room looking back at your body. Maybe imagine being in that tree out the window looking back at your body. Just try to slingshot around a little bit and just to open your mind to the idea that you're spirit. You're one with everything. You could imagine you're way over in another country. You could imagine you're way out on a beach somewhere. Maybe you could imagine you're way out on a boat in the ocean. And just take a few moments to allow your mind to open, to imagine that you're not this little body that is vulnerable to the world. You are not a victim of the world you see. So just kind of move about, just playing around in your mind, And let the Holy Spirit know that you'd like to know more about your greater self, your eternal spirit. And these are ways that we can just begin to get a little more comfortable. A friend of mine that is quite accomplished at leaving her body at will, not that that's the goal, but anyway, she can do that. And she said, you know what the key is? You have to get to where when you leave your body, it's like a piece of butter and bread. It has to mean nothing It has to not make you so excited that you can't think of anything else. You have to be able to be at peace with it and just let it be and just see it like it's nothing at all. And then you can just do it at will. So there's nothing in the course that says you have to leave your body. I'm only suggesting this, that you imagine that you are so much more than a body. And sometimes that's hard to understand, but if we allow our mind to open a little bit, and we can imagine maybe being with a loved one at the other end of the state or whatever it might be, but imagine that you don't stop where your body stops and just begin to open your mind and let Holy Spirit know you'd really like to know more about your true self and a lot less about this little self that you've given so much attention. Let's go to paragraph three. At no single instant... Does the body exist at all? That's a very big statement. At no single instant does the body exist at all. Well, you might look down at your own arm right now and say, well, sure looks like it exists. I can slap myself. I can pinch myself. How could he possibly say this body does not exist? It sounds like nice, happy thoughts, but, you know, it's not real. Well, in fact, it's not real. And if you think about what you're able to do at night in your nighttime dreams, you can see yourself as a body. You can see other people as bodies. And you notice when you wake up the next morning, there's not a whole room full of people, the people that were in your dream last night. Where are they? They're gone because they were in your mind. We have the capacity to make up people, situations, weather, Mountains, sunlight, space, flying, dancing, laughing, crying. We can do all of these things in our dream. So we might just also imagine we're still doing it. And that's not so hard to imagine, especially when the rewards are so great of realizing that we can actually call on the Holy Spirit to help us with what we are seeing with our eyes, what we are feeling that is hurting And if we will let him intervene and heal the thoughts that are putting these things into action, then our entire world can change, and it can even happen instantly. A lot of times it doesn't because we don't want it to change instantly because we don't really like change so much. And so a lot of times it will appear to be a pace that we can accept. But if we can let Holy Spirit know that we're willing, we're happy learners. Holy Spirit, take the helm. Drive the ship. I'm going to relax right over here and just listen to your guidance. And wherever you take it, I'm okay with that. When we start to really give Holy Spirit some room to work miracles in our lives, this is when things can move very quickly. Sentence two. It is always remembered or anticipated, but never experienced just now. Only its past and future make it seem real. 
This is a reminder that everything we see and feel and hear is the effect of our past thoughts. It's kind of mind-boggling when you think of it, but everything you see and hear and feel and touch is the effect of your past thoughts. It's almost like you're driving, but you're always looking in your rearview mirror. So you don't really see what's in front of you. You don't really see what's happening now. You're only seeing what you thought about before. And so that gives us this great opportunity. Because if we're always looking at the past in front of us or our idea of the future, then we have this wonderful opportunity right now to be present in the present. Because if we acknowledge we are the dreamer of our dream, we're looking at our past thoughts in front of us, nothing more. We're not looking at the truth. Then we can invite the Holy Spirit to show us what is real and true in this present moment that has nothing to do with anything that we see. But we also have to be willing for the Holy Spirit to show us what we're asking for. And like I say, we're very committed to our relationships, good or bad, the way that they are. And as much as we complain about them, the idea of Holy Spirit showing us something that we may not be familiar with instead of what we now know, if we don't trust the Holy Spirit, that will feel even scarier than dealing with the frustrations of the moment. So it's a development of trust. The more you turn things over, the more you will trust the Holy Spirit. The more you trust the Holy Spirit, the more you will be willing to let him show you something unfamiliar that you've never seen before because you won't fear it anymore because you trust him. So you'll be willing to turn over the relationship, turn over your fear, turn over your addiction. You'll be willing to let it go because you'll have more trust that the Holy Spirit would only bless you because you come to know it through experience. Sentence four. Time controls it entirely, for sin is never holy in the present. In any single instant, the attraction of guilt would be experienced as pain and nothing else, and would be avoided. It has no attraction now. Its whole attraction is imaginary, and therefore must be thought of in the past or in the future. So the ego has this game, which we assigned, by the way, and its game is to keep you focused on the past or the future, fear of the future, of course, but never on the present, because the present is where the truth is. The present is where God is. The present is where every single thing that is real and true exists. So the Holy Spirit has this big game to play with you to get you either focused on the past and everything that went wrong or what you did not do, did not say, should have said, should have done, or get you focused on the fear of the future or both. And all it does is toggle. You could think of a little fence, and well, let's call the fence the present. The Holy Spirit just gets you hopping one side to the other, past, future, past, future, past, future. If you think about what you're worried about right now, it's going to be something about the past that you feel didn't go well or right or good, or it's going to be something about the future that you feel will not go well or right or good, and you are troubled right now because of either the guilt of the past or the fear of the future. And remember that when we hold on to that guilt that we elect based on our thoughts, it usually comes with a dose of pain. The ego loves pain because pain is this screaming proof that you are a body. You are not spirit. You are a body, and you suffer, and here's this pain. So whenever you feel pain, ask yourself, what have I chosen to feel guilty about? Because usually the pain is your bonus gift that comes with the guilt. Or where am I assigning guilt on someone else? And forgive, forgive, forgive some more. Try to be grievance-free. Try to be a grievance-free zone. If it was Earth, it would be Switzerland, right? That's that free zone. We're going to go with a grievance-free zone. Try to be that person and release everyone. Sometimes I talk about the people that we're judging as kind of like in the barn in our mind. We've got them kind of locked away in there, and we're still judging them. We're still seeing them as this less than whole, less than loving, less than a blessing kind of person. 
and we have to let them out of the barn, every one of them, every one of them. Get those doors open. Get those people out of your barn in your mind. This is just images so that you can remember. So we let them out. We free them. We bless them. We choose to see the light in them, even if we can't, especially then. And we ask, Holy Spirit, will you heal the part of my mind where I am choosing guilt, where I am choosing to apply guilt or extend guilt to another person because it's bringing pain with it and I don't have any interest in this pain or this guilt. So these are things we can do at a practical level, but remember the healing is not up to us, but it is up to us to open to the healing and these are some of the things that we can do. Let's go to paragraph four. It is impossible to accept the holy instant without reservation unless, just for an instant, you're willing to see no past or future. You cannot prepare for it without placing it in the future. Release has given you the instant you desire it. Those words were a realization for me. When I read these words, it was like the lights went on because I used to carry guilt. I thought it was just part of life, that guilt was necessary. It was a necessary condition. I thought that if you didn't carry guilt, you might not know what to do in the future. You might make the same mistake again. And somehow this guilt seemed like it had a purpose. But of course, in Miracles is teaching us that guilt is an election. God did not create you to be guilty or to assign guilt. And when you choose guilt, you're saying through your own declaration of guilt, I am not the holy child of God. I am not entitled to my true divine inheritance. I am not the blessing that God has made. I am, instead of being perfect, whole, complete, eternal spirit, unlimited, I am finite, I am vulnerable, I am powerless, I am guilty, and I deserve punishment at some level. So we only can be one or the other. And I read this sentence, and it just, was a huge awakening. It said, release is given you the instant you desire it. And I thought, really? Huh. Because it seemed like, well, either you could never be released (laughs) fully, or maybe somebody else had to release you because there's always people judging you about something. So that was so profound for me. Release is given you the instant you desire it. And somehow my mind let it in. And somehow in that moment, I forgave myself because I had learned that maybe it was okay to do that, to forgive myself. And everything began to change for the better. Sentence four. Many have spent a lifetime in preparation and have indeed achieved their instance of success. This course does not attempt to teach more than they learned in time, but it does aim at saving time. You may be attempting to follow a very long road to the goal you have accepted. It is extremely difficult to reach atonement by fighting against sin. Enormous effort is expended in the attempt to make holy what is hated and despised. Nor is a lifetime of contemplation and long periods of meditation aimed at detachment from the body necessary. All such attempts will ultimately succeed because of their purpose. Yet the means are tedious and very time-consuming, for all of them look to the future for release from a state of present unworthiness and inadequacy. I think what we learn in that paragraph is that it doesn't need to take time that we can simply be willing to know that we could be released from guilt, we can be released from pain the instant we wholly desire it, the instant we are willing to consider that it's possible. And if we will give that moment to the Holy Spirit to decide for us instead, it can be decided for us. And you would think it would just happen so naturally. The problem is, is that oftentimes, we are not actually giving it to him. Oftentimes, we are choosing to hold on to the problem, 
hold on to our need to solve the problem and then try to invite Holy Spirit to handle it for us. It doesn't work that way. It has to be literally like where you're swimming in the problem in the pool, whatever that problem is, and even mentally stepping out of the pool and turning everything in that pool over the Holy Spirit. So you can see the challenge there is that if you did this, even mentally, it's going to feel like you're vulnerable, like you're leaving this problem exposed, like it might get worse, or you might end up with nothing at all. So your ego is always trying to hold on to you. It's always trying to keep you swimming in that pool. But if you will just do it in little snippets of time to be willing to know you need do nothing, mentally take a break from the problem, Imagine crawling up and out of the pool and just resting over there in the chase lounge, even in your mind, and understand that release is given you the instant you desire it, but you actually have to give it to yourself. The Holy Spirit can intervene instantly, but if you're still twirling the problem or swimming in it, trying to solve it, you're going to feel like Holy Spirit isn't answering you. It's a gentle balance because you can't freak yourself out either. Like if you try to step away from something, you have to do it according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit because then you will know you're taking steps that are going to bring peace to everyone very quickly. Paragraph number five. Your way will be different, not in purpose, but in means. A holy relationship is a means of saving time. The holy relationship is one where the ego is not present, where there is no fear, where there is no judgment or very little. And when we have a holy relationship with someone, it's really that place where we see the divinity within them. We really are able to look past behaviors, personality, mistakes, errors, past the body, past their hair, past their face, We're willing to see straight in to the eternal spirit of all that they are. We acknowledge the truth of them. And so in this way, that's called a holy relationship. The other kind of relationship where you're invested in the body and the images you see and you get caught up in what the other person's doing or not doing, that's called a special relationship. And that is one to be healed from because that's one that tends to bring pain along with it. So he's telling you there that a holy relationship is a means of saving time because the moment you're willing to see the truth of someone instead of all those images, habits, patterns, and behaviors, you're actually just cutting right through time because you're inviting the Holy Spirit to really bring you that miraculous moment called the holy instant. And in that instant, that relationship could actually be healed right there, right in its place. But we have to welcome that idea, welcome that this person is not the images we see. So we're being willing to see the holiness of this person, and it is a means of saving time because at the same time, the Holy Spirit has an automatic invitation to intervene and to bring absolute healing to this relationship. And it can save a great deal of time. Sentence three. One instant spent together with your brother restores the universe to both of you. You are prepared. Now you need but to remember you need do nothing. It would be far more profitable now merely to concentrate on this than to consider what you should do. When peace comes at last to those who wrestle with temptation and fight against the giving in to sin, when the light comes at last into the mind given to contemplation, or when the goal is finally achieved by anyone, it always comes with just one happy realization. I need do nothing. I think it's a good time to give a quick example. I'm thinking of a time many years ago when I was running a healing center with a nonprofit, and I had gotten involved in this big concert kind of thing where someone had asked if our nonprofit would support it and 
basically be the financial arm where people could make donations and help to sponsor this concert, which was great, and it was to help people in the community. And I thought, sure, why not? That sounds great. So when I started to do this situation or get involved, and my background is a business background. I was a CPA for 22 years, and I was a CFO and a lot of finance, a lot of business, a lot of procedures. I pretty much follow the book on these kinds of things because I I guess through my own training, it was very much drilled into me, I would say, the ramifications of if you don't really follow the rules or you don't do it the right way, that kind of thing. So as we started to work together, I realized that this other person I was working with, they didn't really know that there needed to be procedures. They didn't know there needed to be like a segregation of duties. They didn't know that you can't just take cash and throw it in the bank. It's got to have like a process. You've got to show where it came from. You've got to show who it came from. You have to give the receipt. You know, you get the idea. So this was just something completely unfamiliar to this person. So they thought I was crazy. So I started to talk about what we needed to do to be able to manage the money and all that sort of thing. And as gently as I knew how and brought the right kinds of tools and forms and things we needed to do to be able to accomplish this. And also the nonprofits under my name, so I have that fiduciary responsibility to make sure it's taken care of. So this person that I was working with directly just really did not see the point, which sometimes it's hard for me to see the point too. But even though we do have to follow those procedures or there does seem to be these consequences, And so I was becoming very frustrated by it because this person just kind of painted me as this ridiculous, overly demanding, why are you doing this to me? Why do I have to fill out a receipt when somebody deposits money? They just didn't have that understanding. And I kept trying and trying to help them understand. And the bottom line was I had to be able to do these procedures in order to be involved in this situation. So I realized that I was getting very tense. I was becoming anxious. I didn't really want to go anymore (laughs) in terms of going out and working with these people on the event. And I realized that I was kind of letting my ego run the show. And I was kind of new in A Course in Miracles at the time. But I had learned that I need do nothing. It means that I'm going to turn this over to God. I'm going to stop trying to solve it, stop trying to explain it, Stop thinking it's up to me to figure out how to get this person on board because it just wasn't happening. So I paused, gave it all to God, recognized that I was looking at my own belief that people want to take shortcuts or people don't care about what other people need or whatever those beliefs might be that were seemingly showing up at the time. So I forgave the person, forgave the event, forgave myself. You've got to forgive everybody. And I just gave the whole thing to God. And it was so interesting because we all went back to a meeting. This time there were more people there. And I just was committed to I need do nothing. Only I didn't know what that meant at the time. I didn't know what it would look like. So I showed up and immediately the topic comes up about the money, how we're going to manage the money. And someone had asked me, what do we need to do? So I said, well, this is what we need to do. They asked me a question. I laid it all out, explained it again, and then immediately the other person started to really get upset about it and started to express their upset. And I just reminded myself, I need do nothing. I need do nothing. This is in God's hands. It's not up to me to fight this, figure it out, solve it, plan it. I'm just here as an instrument. God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? My goal is peace. And it was so fascinating, first time it ever happened in this way, that the other people in the group started educating the person about the importance of these procedures. (laughs) And it was fantastic. I did not say one word after I explained the procedures, and it was all these other people that actually got involved and helped this person to understand, and ultimately they kind of by majority vote, they voted, yes, let's do these procedures. And I just sat back and I kind of smiled because it all happened beautifully in the end about how it was supposed to go.
but I didn't have to fight for it. I didn't have to argue with anyone. I didn't have to defend myself. I didn't have to prove my point. And when we say I need do nothing, it is a declaration of allegiance. It means it's not up to me. It means that I'm looking at a projection. I'm not looking at the truth. And so, Holy Spirit, you decide for me about this. And then all of a sudden, what was once a very big problem was instantly undone, and it happened right in front of me. So there you go. That's just one of a jillion examples. <laughs> Let's go on to paragraph six. Here is the ultimate release which everyone will one day find in his own way at his own time. You do not need this time. Time has been saved for you because you and your brother are together. This is the special means this course is using to save you time. You are not making use of the course if you insist on using means which have served others well, neglecting what was made for you. Save time for me by only this one preparation, and practice doing nothing else. So he wants us to be able to save time because the Holy Spirit knows that we are suffering. We are suffering for no reason. And he wants us to be done with it. There's a beautiful line in the Course that I love. It says, God wills I be saved from this. So let's lean on that. And as we declare, I need do nothing, it means we're ready to slice through time. We're ready to not have to figure this out ourselves. We're ready to recognize that the problem is right here in our mind. It's not out there. It's not in that person. It's not in that situation. So this person over there that was showing me my old belief that maybe people are unwilling to do things the right way, maybe they're not willing to be honest, they're not willing to take the steps to make sure something gets done correctly. So maybe she was showing me those beliefs. And when I let go of trying to get her to see it properly, that's where the Holy Spirit can intervene, heal my mind, and then voila, then the whole situation starts to show up differently. And in truth, I didn't have to do anything. Let's go to sentence seven. I was also just going to add, from what you were talking before about with miracles, that but really sentence number five is quite extraordinary as we were talking about how miracles typically happen unexpectedly, almost seems like out of the blue, and then nine times out of ten, it's in a way you never could have imagined or thought of, let alone pulled off, even if you somehow did come up with it. Right. So I think it's pretty cool where it says, with thinking the opposite of that way of, I've got to get out there and solve this problem myself. In many instances, one of the things that we try to do or strive for in life, I certainly did, you look at somebody else's success and then you try to go duplicate that or drive yourself crazy your whole life, disappointed because you can't. And where it says in number five, you're not making use of this course if you insist on using means which have served others well, neglecting what was made for you. Neglecting what was made for you is the miracle that comes through that you don't even know about. You didn't have to do anything for. I need do nothing. And it just shows up for you. So I really like that line a lot. (laughs) I do too. And again, everyone, every time Terry and I have gotten a profound answer to a difficult problem and how it came about was always, always something we hadn't considered, we didn't think about. It's something that just happens to you or for you or on your behalf or you're guided to do something you've never done before. So every time you're trying to solve a problem with your own mind, I call it the Rolodex of the past, really all you have to draw from is your own past experiences or what you've seen someone else do, like Terry said. So you've really got this very small little Rolodex of experiences to draw from. And if you'll just forget the Rolodex, I need do nothing. It's totally up to the Holy Spirit. My goal is peace, and I'm willing to know that I don't have a problem because I'm one with God and I'm just going to give more time and attention to the truth and less time and attention to the problem and it will feel like you're abandoning the problem. Just expect that and resist the temptation to make that matter. (laughs) And you will be guided in a very practical way about what to do, what to say, when to do it, how to do it, 
The Holy Spirit is a very practical teacher and will give you steps based on the steps that you understand. And just like Terry said, it could very well look like something that you've never seen or done before. So the greatest thing we can do when we have a problem is realize straight away we don't have the answer. <laughs> and that's hard to do. I spent my whole life with the idea that I'm supposed to have the answer if I'm a CFO. I'm supposed to have the answer if I'm a CPA. Well, I had to kind of unlearn that and make room for the one that always has the answer. And it really is a greater source of strength. Also in the sense that it's kind of like, I want to wear that guy's suit over there because it looks really good. And Spirit's kind of saying, well, why would you want to wear that? It's not going to fit you. It's the wrong size. I have one tailored perfectly for you. And in fact, if people aren't aware at this moment, if you would mention your miracle story series that you've been putting out there. That's a good idea. On our new website, it's called TV. very easy to find. What I've been doing is actually interviewing a lot of the teachers of A Course in Miracles and what their journey is, what they've gone through, some of the things that they've experienced, the miracle stories they have, and in particular on certain holidays like Thanksgiving and then again on Christmas Eve when our show falls on a particular holiday, I like to share miracle stories. So you can go there, A Course in Miracles TV. And we just posted a lovely miracle story by a friend of ours, Jamie, and you'll really enjoy it. And you'll get to hear in the story what the person went through and the challenges they had and the thoughts that occurred to them and the fears that came up and how they kind of plowed through it. A lot of these people are students that we've had a long time, and they have just a wonderful strength within them. But you'll get to hear that journey, and then you can borrow some of the things that they have learned to create a little shortcut even for yourself, but always, as Terry just said, making room for the Holy Spirit suit for you. So don't try to wear their suit, but you can certainly borrow some of the things that you've learned from them and invite those miracles yourself. But it might look very different for you, but the steps that they take are certainly helpful steps, and it will get you headed in a great direction. Let's go to sentence seven. I need do nothing is a statement of allegiance, a truly undivided loyalty. Believe it for just one instant, and you will accomplish more than is given to a century of contemplation or of struggle against temptation. Do you see what he said there? That if we would just believe that we need do nothing for one instant, that we will accomplish more than is given to a century of contemplation. A century of contemplation. So it's so helpful every time you're willing to make room in your mind to remind yourself, I need do nothing. I don't have this answer. This answer is not up to me. I am not the one to solve this problem. The Holy Spirit is the problem solver. My part is to invite him. My part is to understand that the problem is in my mind. It's not happening out there. And if my mind will be healed, I will see the benefits of that healing in the world I see and in the relationships I have. Paragraph number seven. To do anything involves the body. So there's that summary. To do anything involves the body. That's why you need do nothing because the answer doesn't involve the body. The body is an extension of the mind. It's the mind that's running the show, and it's the Holy Spirit that can guide you, heal the mind, and bring you the results that you're asking for, basically. So to do anything means you have abandoned the guide of your mind and you're trying to now solve the problem with your body, with your own volition, with your own plan. So to do anything involves the body. And if we recognize that and we say, I need do nothing, it means we're stepping back from the body in our mind and we're making room for the one that has the answer to solve the problem where it actually was caused, which is in our mind. And it's a natural entry point 
Sentence two. And if you recognize you need do nothing, you have withdrawn the body's value from your mind. Well, that's what we just said. Excellent. <laughs> he said it better than I did. So when you recognize you need do nothing, you are actually withdrawing the body's value from your mind because to do anything involves the body. To do nothing means you're not involving the body. So no matter what the problem is, even if you have an aching back, it sure feels like you need an answer for the body and maybe your body needs to go to the doctor, maybe your body needs to get a pain reliever, maybe your body needs to find a treatment. It sure feels like all of it involves the body. So the minute you stop and you say to yourself, I need do nothing, you're withdrawing the value from the body in your mind. You're beginning to prepare room for the Holy Spirit to intervene. And we want to invite him. We say, Holy Spirit, please heal the part of my mind where I ever decided that I am a body that could be in pain, that should suffer. These are the false images I have made. This is the false story of myself that I am invested in, and I am divesting right now, and I want the truth instead of this. He says, in order to know the truth, we must abandon our own misperceptions. We have to deny the denial of truth. Every time we see ourselves as a body, that's a denial of truth. And if we will deny the denial of truth, that's how we make room for him. So it doesn't mean not to go on with your day, do the things that you do. The Holy Spirit is practical, will give you wonderful guidance on every level, even in the illusion. But if you'd like to see healing, the healing has to take place where the problem occurred, which is in our mind. And the Holy Spirit is the healer. It's not us. And, but we have to make room for him, and this is some of those ways that we can do that. Let's go to sentence three. Here is the quick and open door through which you slip past centuries of effort and escape from time. This is the way in which sin loses all attraction right now. For here is time denied, and past and future gone. Who needs do nothing has no need for time. To do nothing is to rest and make a place within you where the activity of the body ceases to demand attention. One thing is when you see that word sin, I know for a lot of people that's a tough word to, to step over, try to see the word illusion. This is the way in which illusion loses all attraction right now. So that's one word you can substitute um, you could call it error. You could call it fantasy. Sin just means it's the opposite of the truth. It's, it's a mark on what God created as perfect, which is impossible. So that's why it's an illusion. And it's only going to feel as though sin is real while we believe sin is real. Very profound, right? So that's one part. And then this other part is about time. And for those of you that are going through a challenge that seems like it takes time, I know how that feels. Let's say that you broke an arm. You go to the doctor, you get a cast, let's say. That's what you feel guided to do. And the doctor says, you know, it's going to be eight weeks before you can use your arm again. So right there, your mind accepts, okay, eight weeks of suffering <laughs> and not being able to do what I need to do. But right there, you can pause. It doesn't mean you rip your cast off and start using your arm. But please pause. Give the whole situation to God. You might say to yourself, I am under no laws but God's. And dear God, I have this broken arm. It looks like I do. I'm looking at my own projection. And I am learning that this is a false condition. You did not create me to be a body that could break my arm. You did not create me to suffer and have to take eight weeks before I could feel better. So I'm looking at the story I have made. I'm feeling it too. But I will not use this pain to validate that pain is real. I'm feeling pain because I used to believe I was a body that could suffer pain. So here it is. So I'm going to give all of this over to you. 
I'm going to be willing to see all of it differently. And, of course, I have to forgive myself. If I fell down and broke my arm, I've got to forgive myself for that. If somebody ran into me and they broke my arm, I have to forgive them for that. So forgive whoever you're judging. But you can go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want you to decide about this time thing. That the doctor said it would take eight weeks. God bless him. He's doing everything. He knows what to do. But I am under no laws but God's. I am willing to be instantly whole because God created me whole. And if there's any place in my mind that is blocking this experience of healing, blocking my own true identity from my mind, I want the truth instead of this. Will you decide for me about this? Will you use time for me where I might have used it against me? So I am willing for time to be my friend instead of my curse, right? So we're going to just let time be under the Holy Spirit's guidance. This will help you sometimes bring in a much more healed experience more quickly. So just remember that you are not bound by time. Time is something that we made up. Even the scientists will tell you that time is not real, that everything's actually happening simultaneously. But time is a way that we have laid out in our mind in a linear way so that we can kind of sort things out. So time is a context that we made up. And if you hold on to time or you use time to require yourself to suffer for a period of time, you're going to get to be right about that. So place time under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We're going to save some time, and we're just going to say, my goal is peace. My goal is to know my true self, and I stand in it by the authority of God. I stand in the light and the truth of all that I am. Holy Spirit, you decide for me about all of this. I am just going to stay committed and invested in my true self. I am eternal spirit. I am one with God. I am created perfectly. I cannot be broken. I cannot be a body. I cannot suffer. God did not create pain. I do not need to experience pain because God did not create it, and I will not elect it. I am the dreamer of my dream. This is the very sad story I made up. I want the truth instead of this. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for healing my mind and deciding for me about all of this. Amen. You do not need to say all of that. Just giving you lots of different ideas. It's not about the words. It's about what I just shared as the message. It's more about understanding what I said than saying what I said. Does that make sense? (laughs) Hopefully. Okay, let's go to sentence eight. Into this place the Holy Spirit comes and there abides. He will remain when you forget and the body's activities return to occupy your conscious mind. So he's telling us if we will give him time and and meaning that we will not assign a time of suffering to ourselves or someone else, Put time under his guidance, that it could be used as our friend. And let's go ahead and do that. And he says that when you do that, now the Holy Spirit comes and there abides. And that he will remain when you forget. Isn't that cool? So once you invite the Holy Spirit, once you understand what we're saying here, once you're willing to just let that into your mind, the Holy Spirit can actually make himself known to you. And he can remain when you forget. I just love that. And then the body's activities return to occupy your conscious mind, which we know that they will. And it's going to be a constant temptation by our ego to pay attention to it. But guess what? Now we have a resource that is known to us. The Holy Spirit is present and is there even when we forget. And I know Terry and I both that we can be all locked up in a problem about something And then one of us will just instantly remind ourselves, oh, gosh, what are we doing? (laughs) It's almost like the Holy Spirit says, excuse me, but you might want to think about this differently. So even when we forget, you're going to feel yourself pulled back to the truth because you want that. You've invited that. You've made room for that. You've practiced that. And the Holy Spirit loves a happy learner and will make himself known to you. Now let's go to paragraph 8, our last one for tonight. 
Yet there will always be this place of rest to which you can return, and you will be more aware of this quiet center of the storm than all its raging activity. This quiet center in which you do nothing will remain with you, giving you rest in the midst of every busy doing on which you are sent. For from this center will you be directed how to use the body sinlessly. It is this center from which the body is absent that will keep it so in your awareness of it. The more we practice going to that center of peace, it doesn't mean through hours and hours and hours of meditation. He told us that in this section. He said it doesn't take all this time. It takes a willingness to let time be used for our blessing and to go spend time with God. He says even five minutes saves you a thousand years on earth. So we want to save time. We want to know that blessing. And the more you turn to that place of rest, the more you understand you need to do nothing, the more you welcome the Holy Spirit to decide for you, the more that you are a grievance-free zone. You're going to find that the world you see around you starts to get very light, very happy, very loving, very sweet. You're going to feel like you are spoiled. You're going to feel like you are God's holy, happy, blessed, abundant child, and you're going to think, wow, it's so cool to be me. Like, this is so great. There's so many wonderful blessings happening around us all the time. We don't always see them because we are very preoccupied with what is not happening. So let's allow ourselves to be open. We need to do nothing. It means that the problem is not up to us to solve. And then we're going to be doubly aware the problem isn't out there in our bank account. The problem isn't out there on our body. The problem isn't out there in the relationship. The problem is in our mind, and it's the Holy Spirit that has the function to heal our mind. But this cannot happen without our invitation, and it cannot happen until we wholly abandon our investment in the pool of illusions. And the Holy Spirit's going to guide every step along the way. It's going to be practical. You will know the steps to take. You will hear the guidance. If you feel like you're not or that you don't hear that guidance, then drop that conversation. Don't keep telling yourself that because that's a block. If you say, well, everybody else gets guidance, but I don't. Everybody else gets answers, but I don't. Everybody else gets miracles, but I don't. You need to be willing to be wrong about that. That's the turning point in chapter 30. He says, be willing to be wrong about your investment in that judgment. So we're just going to be willing to be wrong about that. Holy Spirit, I am here to listen. I am willing to trust that you're there. I'm willing to trust that you're answering me. I am willing to trust that the problem is in my mind. It's not out there. And I'm asking with my whole heart, that you would heal my mind, and I want the truth instead of my illusions. And I want the happy experience, the happy life that God gave me to have, and I want nothing else and nothing less. And even if I don't know one thing about that happiness, I'm willing to know that if God gave it to me, it's mine, and I'm ready to claim it right now. Amen. All right. Terry, why don't you go ahead and finish us here tonight with one of your Q&As. All right. I am ready for you here. My question is, are there good people and bad people? The answer comes from the text, Chapter 13, Section 6, Sentence 8.4. God's guiltless son is only light. There is no darkness in him anywhere, for he is whole. Call all your brothers to witness to his wholeness, as I am calling you to join with me. Each voice has a part in the song of redemption, the hymn of gladness and the thanksgiving for the light, to the creator of light. Shine on your brothers in remembrance of your creator, for you will remember him as you call for the witnesses to his creation. Child of light, you know not that the light is in you, yet you will find it through its witnesses. 
for having given light to them, they will return it. Each one you see in light brings your light closer to your awareness. Love always leads to love. The sick who ask for love are grateful for it, and in their joy they shine with holy thanks. And this they offer you who gave them joy. They are your guides to joy. For having received it of you, they would keep it. You have established them as guides to peace, for you have made it manifest in them, and seeing it, its beauty calls you home. That is so pretty. There's a sentence in there that I just love. It says, child of light, you know not that the light is in you. You know, that's true. Most of us don't know that the light is within us. And it says, yet you will find it through its witnesses. This means that the people around us are the ones that are going to show us our light. And the way we get that to happen, it says, for having given light to them, they will return it. So this means, it's a little call to love here, that when you see someone you're mad at, frustrated, it could be someone on the TV, it could be someone in politics, could be someone in your bedroom, someone that you're mad at, whoever that is, if you would choose to give light to them, choose to see the light in them, choose to extend your holiness to them, just taking a moment to extend holiness, light, recognize that light in them, especially when they are not showing it to you, especially if they do not seem to see it within themselves. This is when it is highly helpful to see it within them. Just imagine this beautiful light within them. And it says that when you do this, when you extend that light to them, they will return it. And when they do, that's when you will see the light in yourself. Isn't that amazing? So it's not easy to see that light within ourselves, just all by ourselves. Guess that's why... There's over 7 billion of us so that we can practice a lot. But be unwilling to see darkness in anyone. Choose to see the light in them. Ask Holy Spirit to help you to have the vision to see the light in them. This is the only way you're going to see that light within yourself. And it's a beautiful light. And it is longing for you to behold it. Dear God, we thank you for this time together. It's been a glorious time. You are teaching us that we need do nothing. That's so relaxing. It's such a relief. And we are learning that it is not up to us to solve whatever problem we are facing, that we are not a body, and therefore it's not up to the body to do anything. Whatever it is we are troubled by today, we are bringing this to you, and we're turning it over to you, and we, of course, are bringing also the thoughts in our mind that are causing this problem in the first place, that are projecting this false image that we see. You have taught us that all we need to do to have the world that God created for us, which is pure light and love and joy and peace, is to understand that the world we see with our eyes is false. We must understand we are not looking at the truth. And when we are willing to understand that we are not looking at the truth, then you can show us what is true, but we cannot see both at the same time. It's a sequence that must be understood. And so today we stand in readiness. We are willing to forgive. We are willing to be forgiven. We are willing to free ourselves of any guilt. We are willing to free every other person of any guilt We have extended to them. Any person we are seeing is less than whole. We are letting them out of the barn. We are letting them be their holy, perfect self as God created them. Dear God, we thank you that the light within us is the light within them. The light within them is the light within us. Give us the vision to see. We receive our divine inheritance together. Your will be done through us. Amen.